Recording is on. All right, Aaron, uh, take it away. All right, so I was invited to give a talk here today about a paper we love. And this is a paper that I first encountered when I was just starting grad school. I think I was probably about a week or two weeks into my master's program. And I went into one of the professor's offices and was like, I'm bothered by something. Google is crawling the entire internet. It seems like their index is gonna grow like crazy and they're gonna have to essentially have one computer for every computer that's on the internet. How do we deal with these problems of like, Google has to make a copy of the entire internet in order to work? And that professor responded with, ah, you wanna learn about peer-to-peer -peer systems? You should read this paper and handed me this copy of Kademlia. And it sort of sent me down a rabbit hole of studying a bunch of peer-to-peer -peer things, but I am going to present to you Kademlia and a little bit more that I have pulled in a background to try and explain the paper a little bit better, as opposed to just throwing it in blind, because the authors do seem to assume that you know something about this paper. So I'm Aaron Goldman. I'm a security engineer at Twitter. I've done defense research at the Georgia Tech Research Institute, working mostly on radar. Went to Google, where I worked more on things like spam filters, which we can decide whether that's doing more or less good for society than working on radar systems. Tried my hand at a couple of startups, and am now doing research. You can find me on Twitter, at Aaron D. Goldman, on GitHub, GitHub slash Aaron Goldman and just generally places where you see this Georgia Tech hat logo. That tends to be me. So let's start with what is the problem that Kademlia is trying to solve? What does Kademlia do? It is a implementation of a data structure we call a distributed hash table, which is a very complicated piece of software that is solving what is fundamentally a very simple problem in computer science. I need a map from one thing to another thing. I'm used to writing things like this in JavaScript or Python by just being like, brace, brace. There, you've got a map. But here, we want to have a slightly more complicated map because we want lots of different computers that are working on the same system to all be able to add keys to these things and be able to find the value. So at its heart, our goal is just to essentially create a global namespace in which you can save things. So why do we have distributed hash tables? I need to go back in time a little bit. Uh, I'm sure some of the people on this call are old enough that they recognize this logo and screen. There was a program called Napster that was used for sharing copyright-free information between different people in the early days of the internet. And you would designate a folder on your computer and say, I would like this to be indexed, and anyone else who was using Napster could download any file that was in your shared folder on your computer. So you could just share a folder with the world. But one day, we opened this program and it just sat at this screen connecting to server forever because the Napster servers were gone. Someone had unplugged a single Solaris box and the entire network had died. The bad news was a bunch of grad students could no longer get to their music. The good news was they now had time to do research on how to build more reliable distributed systems. So we already knew that we could have a centralized system like Napster where we simply partitioned data. We had had things like co-array Fortran for decades, which simply said, I've got a big array. I'm going to divide my array up, give a chunk to each of a number of different computers, and then have them use message passing to talk to each other. But the early peer-to-peer -peer research introduced this concept of a content area network where they put all of the content in a two-dimensional grid. And now you didn't need to know the entire array and where all of the data was to be able to interact with it. You could simply know your four neighbors. Who's above me, left of me, right of me, and below me in this 2D grid? 
And if I needed to look up a key, I would just say, okay, what direction is that key in to me? And I had the choice. I could either send it to the horizontal direction it needed to go first or the vertical direction it needed to go first. And through alternating between these horizontal and vertical messages, I could get to the place I was going in logarithmic in a square root amount of time. So if I had 16 nodes, this was pretty easy. I'd never go more than four hops. But if I have a million nodes, this goes really badly because I'm now a thousand hops away from some of my content. So we need to do better than this square root size routing. That's when Cord came in. And they said, OK, instead of having a square-shaped namespace, let's have everything be on a giant ring. I'm going to have every node in my network pick a random identifier. And now every key is going to go to whichever node is the closest to that particular key. So each node owns all of the key space from its node ID to the next node ID. And when you go looking for something, you can simply pass it on to this node. And you can figure out how far you are from any particular key or from any particular node by simply subtracting your ID. So it's logically a ring. If you give me a particular key, I can subtract my particular node ID out of that key and get a sense of, OK, like what is my distance to this particular value? So fundamentally, why is this a logarithmic thing to do? So let's imagine we have this ring of cord, which was one of the first distributed hash tables that was really popular. And I'm starting at the top at 0 because I've subtracted out. I'm looking for my key, and I have some set of nodes that I know about in the network. So the routing table in cord says, know more about what's going on near you. So I'm going to know one node that's halfway across the ring, and one node that's a quarter of the way across the ring, and an eighth, and a 16th, and a 32nd, and a 64th, until I get to the point where I've reached my immediate successor. So I say, OK, it's pretty much on the other side of the ring. I'm going to jump to my farthest routing table entry. I go to that node, and it has its own routing table that says, OK, here I can go. But now I don't want to go to my farthest node because I'm going to overshoot it. So I do the price is right thing. OK, which of my nodes is closest without going over to this key? And then I can send it to a second one. And now my third hop is going to take an even shorter hop. And each time I get closer to my key, I have more and more expertise about my network. And finally, that third hop is the place where I have found my key. So I win. And I've done it in logarithmic time. So this is a complicated way of basically just inventing binary search. I'm going to go halfway to my keys some number of times. And because Zeno is not involved here, I will eventually reach to where my key is. So let's take a step back. I've started using some terms for different kinds of data. So let's get explicit about what these mean in Kademlia from the Kademlia paper. The first is node ID. In Kademlia, they've decided to use 160-bit IDs for the node. You're not usually going to need quite that much entropy. It is highly unlikely that there will ever be an instance of Kademlia that has 2 to the 160 nodes in it. However, you want to have a fairly large space for the key IDs because you want to make sure that things are never colliding on keys. But at the same time, you don't want to have to do any coordination to assign keys. So what is the easy way to get a key space that you'll just not have to worry about collisions? Just pick a really big key space. So I'm going to use 160-bit IDs, pick a random number. That's my node ID. Some systems will use, like, take the SHA-1 of your IP address to pick this random number. But how you get that random number is not actually that interesting. The second one is the keys. The main thing that is important about the keys is that they are integers of the same size as the node IDs. So here again, we are using these 160-bit identifiers for the keys. Here we are actually using the SHA-1 algorithm. So typically, you would have some kind of string that you're storing. So you're like, my awesome data file name. 
And it's going to be like, great, that's a string. Strings are stupid. I am going to hash this thing with SHA-1. That's going to give me a somewhat random seeming no dive, a somewhat random seeming key, and then I'm going to stick this thing into my hash table using that 160-bit key. Values are arbitrary byte arrays in most implementations of Kademlia because they don't want to deal with TCP. They just want to deal with UDP. They tend to have a limit and say, your values can be as large as will fit into a UDP packet minus some headers that are important. But conceptually, all you need these keys to be is a byte array. And for some implementations that are willing to say, OK, you can have like 16 megabyte or 32 megabyte keys, and we're just going to open a TCP socket whenever you have more than a UDP packet's worth. And the last concept is a nonce. There's a lot of RPCs in this system. And when you send a request, you want to put some kind of random nonce on each request so you know when it comes back that this is actually the response to the question you asked. And you don't end up with a like, hey, can I please have information about this key? And then you respond with information about some other key, and I get confused. It helps to be able to pair my request and response back up to have these nonces. So the paper gets its namesake from the fact that they changed the distance metric. Unlike in Cord, where my distance metric was take whatever the ID of something is and simply subtract my particular node ID from that node ID to get the distance, they say, oh, actually, we can just use XOR for distance. It's a super cheap operation on most CPUs. And it does, in fact, give you a lot of the properties that you expect out of a distance. So if I have a distance to myself, well, XOR with yourself, you get all zeros. You are zero distance from yourself. That seems very convenient. If you are any other ID that is not yourself, you're going to get a distance that is greater than zero. When you have one distance, it is symmetric. One of the problems with the subtraction metric is A minus B may not be the same as B minus A. So you end up playing these games with like absolute values or wrapping things around to get it to play nice. Whereas here, you can just do your XOR, and you know that A, X, or B will always be the same as B, X, or A. And you get this nice triangle property. So you'll never have a time where going from A to C to B is going to be a shorter distance than going straight from A to B. You can have points that are along the way, or you can have points that are out of the way, but nothing will ever shorten the distance that you're using. So this triangle equality enables you to use this to find the best path through some particular system. The other advantage here is all of the distances are going to be unique. If there is a key, there is always going to be a node that is the node that is closest to that key. Logically, this makes sense, because I can think about, say, all of the distances. Clearly, the number of possible distances in this system is going to be from 0 to 2 to the 160 minus 1. And if I simply were to XOR any distance with my node ID, I would get the thing that is at that distance. So you get this advantage of a totally orderable set of distances. For any key, the nodes have a total order. And for any node, the keys have a total order. And that can become convenient. Logically, they describe it as not being a ring, but as being a tree. So if we imagine the node that is at 0, 0, 1, 1, if it needs to route to a different part of the network, it simply needs to know one node in each of the groups where we have circles here. So it has to know explicitly about 0, 0, 0. But it only has to know about a single node that starts with a 1 in order to have this binary search property of when I take my first hop, I now get into the right part of the network. And again, just like Cord, we have more expertise on the pieces of the network that are closer to our node. So the closer you get to a node, the better the routing tables are, and the better your chances of finding the things that are closer to the node. So in this example, if we are trying to route to 1110, we can take a first hop that gets us, I don't actually know if y'all can see my mouse, uh, that gets us to the correct half of the tree. The second one gets us to the correct half of half of the tree. 
and then half of half of half of the tree and so on so that in a log base two number of hops, we can get to any node that is in the tree that we are trying to reach and collect our information. So what are the RPCs? What do we actually need to be able to tell each of these nodes in order to build the system? So the first most obvious one is find value. The whole thing I'm trying to do here is just take a key and find the value for the key. So I need to be able to call a node and say, hey node, do you know the answer to my question? What is the value for this key? Now in Kademlia, the response is gonna come back in one of two ways. Either the node is gonna be like, yes, I have the answer for you, you win. Here is the value for your key. Or it will be like, sorry, no, I can't help you find your key, but I know a guy. And it will send you the IP addresses and UDP ports and node IDs of the K nodes that are closest to, that the K nodes that it knows about that are closest to that key. So it'll say, I don't know where you need to go, but here is some information about the routes on the table. And now you can start looking through the new nodes that you've discovered and say, okay, maybe one of these new nodes can help me find the key. And I can do this iteratively. So I can pick the closest key and it will either give me back the value or closer keys, which will give me back the value or closer keys. And as long as my getting closer to the node ID that is closest to the key improves my probability that it knows the key, then I'm gonna win. The second attribute is to explicitly do find node. This is useful for building your routing tables where you're not looking up a specific key. So for example, if I'm just joining the network and I just need to know about a certain area in the network, I don't want to short circuit and go to someone and be like, hey, do you have this key? And have them just be like, yes, here's the value. Like, no, the entire thing I was trying to do was to go find out about which nodes exist in the network. So I need to have an explicit find node that says, no, I'm not trying to look up a key just pretend you already key missed and give me the nodes closest to some value. Store is sort of the heart of making these things persistent. This is when I call a node and say, hey, you node, here is a key, here is a value. Please remember it until the time to live expires on this particular value. Or your cache gets full or whatever. There's numerous conditions where it's gonna forget a key. But the point is, I've given it a key and said, hey, do me a favor, remember this for me. And the last one is ping. Ping is the dumbest one, and all it includes is the nonce, where you're just like, hey, node, you dead? And it comes back, and it's like, I am not dead. Here's your nonce. I've proven to you that I am still here, and if you send things to my IP address, I can respond to you. And this is very useful for building your routing tables. You never want to believe a node who just shows up and's like, hey, I'm a node, I'm at this IP address. You should totally start sending traffic at me because that's just someone who's just trying to DOS someone off of the internet. If there's going to be potentially millions of these nodes on the internet, you don't want to be able to have someone bounce things off of you and just hammer some server. So you only want to believe that someone is really on the web once you have sent them a ping and they came back. Now. You get a secondary effect that pings work, that all of the other three RPCs work as pings because they all have nonces in them. So you can trust any of them, but there are some times where you just need to keep things alive. So the next step is the routing table. I've mentioned a few times, like tell it about the node that you know that's closest to it. Well, how do you store this information about the nodes that are closest to it? And the answer is we are going to keep a set of different rows in this table. So in a early scenario where you know about less than K nodes, uh, usually 20, you're just gonna remember all of them. There is no point in forgetting any node ever if you only know about 20 nodes. If you have a network where the entire distributed system is only 16 nodes, they might as well all know about each other and route perfectly to the one who knows what's going on best. But as the number of nodes starts growing, let's say you had 100 nodes in the network or 1,000 nodes in the network, now you want to play these games of, I have more expertise about pieces of the network than other pieces of the network. So if I start with zero, then I'm going to say, everything that starts with a one, I'm going to throw into one bucket. And once I know 20 nodes that start with a one, even if I can't discover new nodes that start with a one, I don't care. 
I'm only going to save up to 20 in that half of the grid. And then the ones that match one bit with me, I'm going to store up to k nodes. And once that's full, once the ones match with two bits with me, then I'm going to store up to k nodes. Now, logically, this could be 160 nodes deep inside this tree, but we don't actually get there because we say, for the stuff that's closest to you, I'm just going to have a catch-all bucket that's, remember the k nodes closest to me is the bucket at the bottom, and I only add more buckets as things get full. So if I have a network that starts very small, as it grows, I'm only going to have to allocate new memory each time I need a new bucket to fill. And then I'm going to split. OK, here are my k nodes closest to me. Some of them are going to go into my new bucket, and some of them are going to stay in this like k closest nodes to me. So the replacement of entries. The protocol is fairly straightforward. If I discover that a new node exists and I don't know about k nodes at that distance, just save it. Like, simple, easy. Send it a ping, prove that it's alive, store the thing. If someone arrives who is new to me and I already know about 20, now I need to make a decision. Do I want to keep the 20 nodes I know about or do I want to replace one of them with the new guy? And Kademlia has this rule, which is respect your elders. The thing that you've known about long enough that is still alive is likely to still be alive. We really want to trust the nodes we already know, because otherwise we're going to have someone who can come to us with a tax and say, hey, I'm this node ID. OK, now I'm this node ID. OK, now I'm this node ID. And just replace your entire routing table. And then once they're the only person in the world you know, they start ignoring you, and you're disconnected from the network. So to prevent attacks, you want to trust people who've proven themselves by being trustworthy in the past. So when a new node shows up, you go to whichever of your 20 nodes in that bucket you haven't heard from in the longest time and say, hey, you dead? And if they're not dead, they get to stay on your list. And if they are dead, then you have an opening for a new node to join and be cool in your network. The insight here comes from the fact that most nodes have some probability of going down. So if we imagine that there are different kinds of computers in the world. So let's say some of them are really small computers that are run on batteries and use wireless connections so that they're moving from one cell to another and have very spotty network connections. They are very likely to miss a ping when you talk to them because they keep coming and going and changing their IP address and just being flaky. There are other nodes that are like built into metal racks with hardwired internet and redundant power and dedicated SREs who do nothing but make sure those computers are up all the time. They tend to stay up for very long periods of time. And we can learn this by just saying, OK, however many hours it's been since this thing failed to respond to one of my pings, that's probably how reliable it is. Things that go down once an hour will probably never have been seen by you every day for a year. And things that are staying up for years are not likely to go down in the next hour. And you measure this empirically from a number of different places and come to the conclusion that this is actually really powerful. Respect your elders is a good way to build a much more reliable network. This is the description that I covered a little bit prematurely of start with your buckets, and only once a bucket fills up do you then split and go down the tree. So you don't want to just immediately split everything. You're going to end up wasting memory. You want to keep your tables pretty dense. But at the same time, you don't want to just keep everything in a static array. You want to be able to add new things to your rows. So split the buckets when you need to. And when things are close, Here's an example of sort of a relaxed tree where you're storing more things that are sort of chaotic as you get close to you. For your k closest buckets, just remember them all because you need to have the maximum expertise on the stuff that's near you and the structure of the network will break down. If there's a million nodes in the network or a billion nodes in the network, you're very likely to have a nice uniform shape near the top of the tree. When you get to the very bottom of the tree, that's where randomness is going to take over. And like maybe it's a little deeper on one path and a little shallower on another path. You don't care. So the next question is, who do you call? So in a network like Cord, 
you always called the node that you knew about that was closest without going over. And this led to serious performance problems because what if the node that is closest in the key space is actually in Australia? And now you are sending these long ping times away and long ping times back. With Kademlia, they said, okay, let's play this new game, which is called figure out who's got the shortest ping time by pinging everybody at once. So you pick an alpha metric, they usually default this to three or five. And you just say, I am going to ping five of the K closest nodes. And whoever gets back to me first gets back to me first. And whoever doesn't get back to me first, who cares? Maybe they're in Australia. So now if there's one computer that's in the same rack with me and one computer that's in Australia, I don't find myself waiting for the long ping times. I can just get it from the person who's closest to me. And this dramatically speeds up the system. One of the optimizations that's not in the formalisms of the paper that they use for proofs is you can actually measure the ping times. You don't have to pick a random three of the K closest nodes, and you don't have to pick the actual alpha closest nodes. You can say, I'm going to pick the three nodes that I historically have seen the lowest ping times to. And if I am explicitly picking the fastest of those, I can very quickly get through the beginning of my tree because, frankly, a lot of people have similar expertise. So if I now have a rack that's got lots of nodes in it, I should get that win of using all of the routing tables of all the people who are in the same rack as me, get that efficiency. And only after that, when I really need to go talk to someone who's far away, talk to someone who's far away. So this is just the rule of five, which is roughly about statistics. If I pick a random sample of five things, there is a 93% chance I'm doing better than the median. Like it doesn't take a lot of these just picking the three fastest nodes of 20 means you get much, much better latency, even though the actual lowest latency node to you may be anything in there and hard to find. This sampling works really well in practice. Okay, so how do we join one of these networks? You start up your computer, you would like to start doing lookups, but your routing entries are empty. So we begin this process with know that some node W already exists. This is the node that you discover by miracle. Either someone gave it to you as a command line argument or when the last time someone did a build. So we used to see uh, BitTorrent clients that would check the hash table and see what were the 10 nodes that have been up longest and been most reliably pingable and build that into the binary every time they ran a build. So they would go and be like, who's the healthiest 10 nodes? Great, you all get baked into the binary that we are going to ship. And now when the thing wakes up, it's gonna call the 10 most reliable nodes and start. People stuffed these in DNS records, tried to use multicast DNS. Like there's a bunch of tricks here for how do you find the first node, but essentially first node appears by miracle. Now I insert the first node into my routing table and I start doing my routes and say, I would like to look up my own node ID. Hey, node W, who's the K nodes closest to me? And I will hear back from them, stuff all of those guys into a replacement queue and start pinging each of them and be like, hey, who are the nodes closest to me? Who are the nodes closest to me? Who are the nodes closest to me? And they're gonna give me more nodes that are even closer to me. And this is going to fill out my tree because logically, as I go through it, I am going to find more and more nodes. And as I get closer and closer to me, I'm gonna find nodes that know more and more about my area of the namespace. So now this is going to naturally populate me with just the kinds of routing tables I need. Meanwhile, because I have pinged these other components and said, hey, I'm a node and I exist, each time I do one of those requests, I've now informed them that I exist. So they're gonna piggyback a ping. So I'm gonna message them and they're gonna send me a whole bunch of nodes and I'm gonna send back a ping. And now I'll have done the full handshake and I can add myself to their routing tables. So not only have I populated my routing table by doing this, I have also inserted myself into routing tables all over the network so traffic will be able to find me. 
And then when I'm done with this process, I go through and I refresh each node and say, okay, these are the nodes that I have decided to bless as being my k closest nodes in each bucket. I'm going to ping each of them, make sure they're all still alive, and none of them were like total fluke bit errors. I added someone. And now I'm solidly in the network, and the network is solidly in my node. OK, so getting a key seems like the logical next step after joining the network. The search is pretty simple. The first rule is you terminate the search when someone gives you the value. Once you've found the value, you don't need to keep searching for the value. You've already won. The second rule is locate the Kang closest nodes that you know about and pick ping the alpha of them who you think can answer your question. Now, one of two things will happen. Either they'll answer your question, or they'll give you new nodes that are closer to your destination that you can check. Most of those nodes aren't going to be nodes that you're actually going to add to your routing table because your routing table is already full and those are new nodes that you're just discovering and we trust old nodes first. Once you have found your thing by having gotten close enough to that where the key lives, you say, okay, who's the like one up? Who told me about this node that actually found me my key? I'm going to send a store value to them. Now, you could imagine someone saying, oh, well, if I want a good cache, why don't I give it to the whole line of everyone who helped me find that node? And the answer is it's unnecessary because the key is either hot or it's cold. And if the key is cold, there's no point in caching it all over the place. And if the key is hot, someone's going to show up behind you and they're going to start checking and they're going to find the node that you had cached one node farther away from the key. And they're going to move it up by one. So if you ever have a key that's like super hot and there's tens of thousands of nodes that are all hammering and requesting that key, because all of those requests have to converge as they get close to the key, the things that are closest to the key end up caching it and it gets a little bit further away and a little bit further away and a little bit further away. And as you get further away, you get sort of larger and larger concentric rings of paths into the node that are all caching it. And you end up with about the right number of servers caching each node all the time because it is, in fact, the large amount of traffic that does it. So each time you find a key, you increase the caching by one by telling the key that is one further away about it. Second is put key. So let's say we need to store a key. Now we have this problem of who is the one who I should actually store the key to. Now, in a network like Cord, we said, well, Whoever is the closest without going over is the authoritative source, and they get to store it. But Kadenlia's attitude is the world's crazy and full of errors, and everything's going wrong all the time. Rather than having the closest key be the authoritative source, we are going to send it to the K closest keys. I'm going to tell all 20 people that are the 20 closest nodes, here's my key. And I don't actually care whether they learned it or not. So rather than something like Cord, where I'd be like, hey, Node, store this key for me. Did you learn it? Read it back. Oh, you got it back. Like, I know it's sound. In Kademlia, I'm just like, fire off 20 UDP packets. Some of them will get there. Some of them will get deleted. Whatever. It's all fine. Hopefully, something got stored somewhere. And now, when people start doing the caching, well, they're going to fix it up for me and add more caching layers. So as long as one of them made it there, I don't care. So I don't even need to verify that anything made it there. Now, every hour, one of the nodes who stores a key has this question, which is like, OK, what keys am I responsible for? And the answer is, well, only the K closest nodes store it. But do you really know if you are one of the closest nodes to that thing? So you look at your routing table and say, OK, here's my heuristic. Do I know of at least 20 nodes that are closer to this key than I am? If yes, it's their responsibility to make sure this key is preserved. I don't need to do anything. If no, it's my responsibility to make sure this key didn't get deleted. But maybe somebody else already made sure that this key didn't get deleted and recopied it. So I'm going to say, well, has someone told me about this key in the last hour? If they told me about the key in the last hour, I assume someone else is doing the maintenance. I don't have to do the maintenance. 
But if I'm in this magical place of it's been over an hour since anyone told me about this key, and I think I'm one of the 24 closest nodes to this key, then I'm going to contact the 20, the K closest nodes and say, OK, all of you, here's the store. So you all need to remember it. So again, if I have partially succeeded in storing my key and I only told three or four of the 20 nodes about my key, when this refresh comes about, they'll sort of fix each other up. The second aspect of that is Kademli was never designed. It was mostly used for BitTorrent. You want to know if someone is seeding. If you haven't heard from someone in a while, they're probably gone forever. So there was also a time to live on everything that said, OK, from the time I get a store, you get 24 hours. And then it's just going to time out, and I'm going to let things be deleted. You need to re-advertise whatever information exists in about 24 hours. Uh, but there's no reason it had to be 24 hours. It's just every key should have some time to live for which it is processed. So this is a different philosophy than we used to see. When we were looking at Cord, it said, I have two strong invariants that I need. For Cord to behave correctly, every node needed to know about its successor. Add successor and remove successor needed to be like transactional things that happened. You called, you got added, it knew about it, you were being very hard. The Even the original Cord paper was criticized in a later paper that's like, hey, your proof of correctness is wrong because there's a race condition where your transaction for changing the successor could be wrong and you'll like lose a note. Kademlia is like, no, I don't care. My invariant is you learn vaguely about things that are going on in your area. Hopefully you hear about what's going on. When you want to store something, there's no one authoritative source. You throw it at the K closest nodes. It's super approximate, and you're just like, I'm reading things. Hopefully, the random strangers I know know about better paths to where I'm going. As paths disappear in the network, I just fall back to some of the other alpha nodes to respond. The whole thing is just very loose and crazy and not very reliable at any point, but at the same time, using redundancy to get the reliability. It's easy to find paths, even if a node went down, because I messaged alpha nodes. It's easy to find a stored copy, even if the node that was closest went down, because I stored it at k nodes. So the invariants are much weaker. And because there is a total ordering, as long as each node I talk to knows about a node that is closer to my result, I can always manage to make forward progress. So the paper starts by saying, we, if you want to have it be a logarithmic time constraint, you do, in fact, need to know about only a single node in each of your buckets is enough to give you logarithmic. But if your constraint is violated in some places, that's kind of OK to like, make some progress. Don't earn another bit, but move in some way closer to the destination. Hopefully, that person has a row that is a little bit better. So you can sort of you burn a hop for every time you violated the constraint rather than giving up the correctness of the algorithm. So the next question we ask is, OK, so we can do this in log base too. But like, if I have a trillion nodes, that's like 30 hops, 40 hops. I don't really want to do 30 or 40 network RPCs to look up one piece of data. Can we do better than this? And the answer is yes. We could, in fact, do this one bit at a time and do all the trees and do everything as I've been describing it so far. Or we could say, rather than thinking about bits, I'm going to think about collections. So let's say I take five bits at a time. And I'm going to do this like base 32 encoding of the node ID. I'll grab the first character and say, did this match? If it didn't match, rather than simply jumping to the right half of the tree, I jump to the right 32nd of the tree. And I now keep a new bucket, not just for each how many characters did you match, but for each what is the next character in the character where you first don't match me. So this takes a lot more space, but also it makes the number of rows you have shorter. 
So it's actually only about six to seven times as much space to make the thing be log base 32 instead of the log base two. So dramatically shorter trip times. But your routing table gets better. So B is the parameter for how many bits at a time you want to do this. In most production uses of Kademlia, B has been set to five. That seems to be the right answer. I can't tell you whether 32 is genuinely the right fan out to have here, but I can tell you that it is a better choice than two and it is a better choice than 2000. So like, fine, you know, 3264 probably doesn't matter much. And the routing table sizes aren't that large. So if you compare it to something like say cord or the CAN network that we talked about at the very beginning that was just the big square, then these routing tables seem huge because that was like guaranteed to have exactly four routing entries at any time. But it's only about, so if we make the assumption that for each entry, I need to store the 20 byte ID and an IPv6 address, that's like 16 bytes and the UDP port that they're talking on and some kind of round trip time, so maybe two bytes for the number of milliseconds it took me to talk to them. And I can set something like, well, for the top number, instead of being 65535 milliseconds, we'll just like call that infinity and be like, yeah, you never responded. Fine. Um, now I can store in 40 bytes who I'm talking to, where you are, what your ID is, and if you are stale. If K is 20, as I suggest in the paper, and B is five, as they suggest in the paper, you only need 25 kilobytes for each layer. So each time your network gets 32 times larger, you use another like 25 kilobytes of memory to store the routing table. In our large scale systems today, like we've just got the memory. So we might as well store these routing tables and get all of the reliability and performance we get out of having these larger routing tables. Um, to give some realistic examples, 32 million is about the number of nodes that are connected to the BitTorrent network at any given time. It's usually between one and 32 million. And a trillion nodes is the rough estimate of the number of CPUs in the world right now. And even that would only be about 200 kilobytes. So in theory, we could do true internet scale Kademlia, where every node on the internet was using Kademlia instead of DNS and we really wouldn't blow up these tables. This is my one commercial slide in this talk. Uh, if you have enjoyed my description and you would like to work on large distributed problems where we care a lot about reliability, you can contact me and I'll talk to you about the job openings we have at Twitter in building large distributed systems. And with that, I would like to open it to questions. Is there any questions about Kademlia or the performance of Kademlia or ways that we would like to attack this or just generally? I should have pointed out the link to the slides is in the bottom corner if anyone is uh, interested in following along with the slides. Thanks, Aaron. Well, first of all, I want to say awesome talk. This is, it's really fun uh, to, uh, to see all this it's super, super cool. Um, uh, well explained understanding of how uh, distributed hash tables work in general. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was uh, in most implementations of Demelia, uh like this is a five seems to be the right number. Uh, I, I was curious from that, uh, how many different implementations uh, are there out there, either open source or uh, that you know of uh, in, uh, that, that are in commercial use today? So I know there is one implementation in Python that's pretty popular. <clears throat> and there was one implementation in C that was written by the like BitTorrent company. Um, I believe it goes by the name mainline DHT. And it largely got incorporated into a number of different projects. So most BitTorrent clients you get today have the same C implementation. It had a interesting quirk, which was that the mainline distributed hash table at first was being used by MicroTorrent and Azurius and the BitTorrent official client. And there were three separate hash tables. 
but Azurius has a plugin system and someone wrote a plugin to be like, hey, I want my BitTorrents to go faster, so also check the MicroTorrent and BitTorrent distributed hash tables to see if you can find any seeders there. But they didn't isolate the code very well. So it started advertising things it would discover on one of the hash tables to the other two hash tables. And after about a week, after the one person was doing the research on how to build this plugin, they had actually tied the hash tables together and they all merged. And we ended up with one BitTorrent hash table essentially for the entire world that we kind of can't pull apart now because you would really have to delete all of the routing tables of every BitTorrent client on the entire planet and start them again. Like it's one of the tricks with this particular hash table is once you introduce two of them, they tend to sort of gradually poison each other until they become one network. So there is real value in the fact that they all used the same code base or if a new one is doing it, if you make things that are really compatible choices with other people's hash tables, you can really bake into them. I am very curious about um, maliciously chosen node IDs. Uh, it seems like maybe if you wanted to try and black hole something out of the uh, hash table, you might be able to do it by uh, maliciously choosing a node ID that's very, very close to the thing you want to black Yeah, hole. so in the earliest implementations, it was pick whatever node ID you want to pick. What you start to see later on is I'm only going to trust you when you tell me what your node ID is if your node ID is the SHA-1 of the IP address at which I can reach you. Okay. Now, the advantage of this is you can't generate 4 billion IDs because you know there's only 2 to the 32 IP addresses, and you can't get many of them. This became a weaker protection when we started using IPv6, and it actually was kind of feasible to route an entire slash 64 to your computer. And then you could generate very large numbers of node IDs and get close to whatever it is you want to delete. Now, one of the issues here is you actually need to not just be the closest node to the node to the key that you wish to take over. You actually need to be the closest K nodes. So you have to be, even if you're just trying to kill the one key, you are probably going to have to generate north of 20 times as many IDs as there are nodes in the entire network to guarantee that you have become all 20 closest IDs. Um, the other proof I've seen is, um, I don't know if this actually got deployed in production, but I've seen in research papers, is proof of work based identity that says, you have to show me your key and you have to show me a number that when concatenated with your key hashes to something with a large number of zeros in the front. Right. And the more zeros in that thing, the more powerful your key is. And then when there seems to be funny business around a key, you start saying, okay, anything in this part of the tree, you have to have 24 preceding zeros before I'm going to trust any node ID. And now to be in that part of the tree, you have to do a certain amount of work in order to get nodes that are in that area. Um, but yeah, there's whole games of how to defend against someone who's trying to steal a part of the tree. OK. Other questions? Do people feel like I gave a fair history of it? I feel like I spent a lot of time talking about Cord for a talk that was supposedly about the Kademlia paper, but I actually like uh, when when you dig in or when folks dig into the history behind a paper, especially like looking at the at what you know where it came from because they you know a lot of times with with academic papers you uh, uh, the, they, like you said at the beginning of the talk, uh, there's assumed knowledge, right? So like going into a little bit of the detail of that assumed knowledge is helpful. Yeah, I just find that, so the image that I have on the screen now with the multiple hops to get to the right part of the tree, they talk about how XOR is a much better metric because 
you can think about like neighborhoods of the tree rather than having the ring. But in fact, the thing that they're using XOR for is figure out a distance between you and the node and send it to the node that's closest to where you're going. I feel like the ring is actually a much better analogy for that. That's like, yeah, I'm just getting to the part of the ring where the key is. And whether you're using subtraction to get a distance from the node or whether using XOR comes out roughly the same, except that XOR is obviously a lot cheaper than subtraction because you don't have to do all the carries. They're actually right. um, exactly identical uh, in a certain respect. Uh, group theoretic uh, gets into group theory. Uh, XOR and subtraction are basically the same operation, just in different groups. Yes, group theoretically they are equivalent, but the carries cost you voltage, so you will draw less power if you are doing XOR. Yes, one is one is cheaper to do than the other, but from a yeah, it's about half of, the NAND right. gates, but it's the same complexity. Yep, which is weird. Actually, you can have things that are perfectly identical complexities but different numbers of AND gates, but that's right. just my own head not wrapping around things nicely. I was talking uh, identical in terms of usage as a distance metric. Ah, yes. Going back to the original question, I'm actually in uh, advanced distributed systems class now, and we recently went over Cord. So seeing you compare and contrast, contrast against Cord was actually really helpful for me to understand this. Thank you. Yeah, the main thing that is the reason why Kademlia won is the like B at a time routing which interestingly is a adaptation that you can do to cord also, like in the same way that, here is my, um, if I have the, like here's my thing that's halfway across and thing that's a quarter of the way across and thing, like I could have 32 that are 1 32nd across and 2 32nds across and 3 32nds across, and then have my one that is a quarter be 32 in this piece and then 32 in the next piece. So you actually can pull the exact same trick on cord. It's just that looking at the XOR metric and prefixes, it was obvious that that was a thing you could do. And looking at the subtraction, it was not as obvious that it was a thing you could do. As well as the fact that when Kademlia paper came out, no one cared about using hundreds of kilobytes of data to store the routing table because like, would you notice if your computer had 100 kilobytes less memory? Um, whereas Cord was much older, and they were very focused on how do we keep the routing table small, and how do we keep it? And like the idea of, oh, I can make the routing table six times the size in order to do log base 32 instead of log base 2 was just not something that would have been interesting to the original paper writers. I will say, uh, I've talked for a while about I kind of want to make a version of Cord where instead of the authoritative node being the closest node, the authoritative node is that the closest node is the leader, and the four nodes before it are the consensus group. So you can actually like do Paxos or Raft and real transactional ACID correct versions of that. I would be curious to see someone make a version of Kademlia that does the same thing and say, okay, the 10 closest nodes the, you know, some subset of the K closest nodes form a real consensus group that you can do ACID transactions on and make a ACID Kademlia. Because Kademlia as it exists is super not interested in consistency. Like as you're starting to cache further and further up the tree, it's more and more stale. And like, if somebody updates the key and they update the key close to the source, your cache is never going to hear about that because requests don't go past the cache. They stop when they hit the cache. Basically, there's no delete or replace operation that's uh, at all reasonable in Kademlia. Um, depends what you mean by at all reasonable. <laughs> um, so they do have the heuristic of you should consider your cache stale after 24 hours. But if you're one hop away from the best place, 
you should do it in half of that. And if you're two hops away, a quarter. And if you're three hops away, an eighth. So if you, instead of being one of the K closest, you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who's one of the K closest, then you're only actually going to cash it for about five minutes, which at first seems crazy because you're like, you won't be able to do atomic updates. And on the other hand, you're like, wait, that's just DNS. <laughs> Yes. Um, Microsoft has a bunch of papers about consistency where they talk about it is really the requester who should say what kind of consistency they want. <clears throat> so if I were, say, making a acid version of Kademlia, as I would like to take the time to do at some point, I would have the requester able to say, hey, give me your thing, but I need less than an hour of staleness. And if your cache wasn't signed by the consensus group in less than an hour, then I'm going to go a little bit closer and see if they've got it in less than an hour, and then go a little bit closer and see if they've got it in less than an hour. So that way, if I really want to do a hard, consistent read, I can be like, give me the thing, but it needs to be signed by someone in the consensus group in the last three seconds. Or it can be like, give me the thing, but it needs to be signed by someone in the consensus group in the last three months. Like, Right. Often the reader knows whether the level of consistency they need. You know, if I'm checking the baseball scores, I don't actually care if I'm a few minutes out of date. What? What's I disagree. You care if it's a baseball, if it's a playoff game. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's the point is it's your choice. If it's early in the season and all you care about is, am I three games back or am I five games back? You can have your phone do that query once a day and tell you the results once a day. Whereas during the playoff game, you're like, no, give me the three second update. <laughs> I need to know every three seconds has the score changed. Was Why put all the stress on the network of doing these like atomic consistent reads when frankly, most readers don't care. Was there much tweaking of this algorithm over time? Um... I think you mentioned like part of the reason why they had new versions of the software was to just to embed uh, some of the highest uh, highest uh, nodes that have been around for the longest period of time periodically. I was curious, um, was there amongst say the different BitTorrent implementations, was there a lot of tweaking of the parameters or what do you know about that? So pretty much everyone agreed on um, K should be 20 and B should be 5. There was less agreement on alpha should be 3. There were some people who were like, I'm just going to ping 5 nodes at a time and get more reliability, even though I'm going to consume more bandwidth. And I think there's one of them, although I don't remember which one, that starts with pinging just the lowest latency one and was like, yeah, the, the person with the lowest latency tends to also have the lowest error rate. And why am I bothering with all the rest of this stuff? I just want to do one. And then if that fails, three. And then if that fails, five. Um, there was a paper that talked about storing a reliability score with each node that you talk to to be like, this node responds one in four times, and this node responds one in five times, and this node responds one in 20 times, so that you can add up nodes until you get to a certain probability of getting a response back that is the level you need, which turns out only to have been useful for NASA in sending messages between planets, and not particularly useful for the internet. Uh, but a lot of that technology never really made it into Kademlia, but did make it into IPFS as it is used by NASA. But yeah, I, I look at this paper to this day and, you know, it was a great paper when I was a grad student because you read it and you're like, oh, I can see all this follow on stuff that I want to work on. Um, and then I read it now, decades later, and I'm like, oh, there's all this follow-on stuff that I want to work on. <laughs> um, ironically, one of the 
first things I did when trying to do research with this network, uh, it turns out that when you throw stores at the BitTorrent client, it immediately trusts them. But if you respond with something that is malformed, the thing that you gave the answer to will call you back and be like, hey, dude, you gave me malformed data. Delete that bad key. And it will delete the bad key, which means you can put malformed garbage into mainline DHT, and it will just live for a couple of hours until somebody stumbles across your malformed data and deletes it. Um, so I did some research on like, how can I make self-deleting emails where I send you the email and if you open the image within the first 24 hours, then you'll be able to decode it because you'll be able to pull the key out of mainline DHT. But if you've waited between like 16 and 36 hours, there's a good chance that somebody noticed the corruption in the hash table and deleted the corrupt keys. And now you can't open my file. So I get a like self-deleting. If you didn't open this in time, you will never will be able to open it because I poisoned the hash table. Uh, which then later the IRB was like, um, no, you can't just like poison other people's public goods so that you can get your paper, which was like, oh, fine. <laughs> Maybe we should stop the recording before I continue that conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can stop. But uh, well, before I stop, I want to uh, thank you so much again for uh, for this great paper and uh, see if I can uh, recruit other folks to to give papers. Uh, check it out. This will be on YouTube. Uh, the first one's already up. Uh, and again, thanks so much, Aaron. Yeah. Stopping now. Oh, by the way, if you were looking for it, there is somebody else who did finish that research and publish that paper. So if you want to know <laughs> about storing data temporarily by poisoning Kademlia. Wasn't that 